welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. This is the place where we take a no bullshit look at life's little lessons. Here, together, we find the spiritual glory in even the most wicked hard story. This is a journey from fear back to love and how we can find our greatest strength and happiness in some of the most unlikely places. I believe that if you're willing to change your mind, you can totally change your life. So, are you ready to rewrite your story and choose to live free? Let's do this. Hey, you guys. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Episode two of the Karen Kenny show. Uh, look it. A little lipstick. <laughs> okay, you know what this is about? I'm going to tell you. Uh, I found an old picture of myself. Well, actually, uh, one of my friends who I love, Jessica Todd, fellow mass hole, and uh, Queen Bee over at the Jessica Todd Salon in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, we were talking when I got my hands on last time about like my hair and like how straight it is and blah, 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 right? And then I was like, dude, back in the 80s, uh, I was also a victim of big hair and I used to like perm my hair and everybody, we were like, that's pretty funny. And then I was like, someday I'm going to show you a picture of me with permed hair, okay? And so I went through my pictures. Uh, because I was looking for pictures for something else for uh, somebody I hadn't seen in like 20 years who I was going to surprise visit on, story for another day, uh, somebody who was on a TV show that millions of kids loved. Okay, it's a little teaser, little teaser. But anyways, when I was looking for those pictures, I found this other picture of me with the perm. And uh, when I was looking at it, I was laughing wicked hard because not only did I have the big hair 80s perm, but then I had like wicked thick like eyeliner on and big hoop earrings and total lipstick. And I was like, oh my God, like I, I don't usually put like color on my face. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a shot and see what happens. So long story short, this is what's going on. So for those of you at home who are tuning in, in the earbuds, I'm right in your ears right now. Um, it's kind of like a Rose, no, it's like a pinkish, like kind of color. Like, I'm so bad at the girl stuff, you guys. So, anyways, Jessica Todd promised me that she was going to sit down with me one day and we were going to have like a girly day to help with all this. Because <laughs> you can see, like, I don't, like, this is the first time I've blown dry my hair, blue dry, blue dry my hair in like two months, you guys. <laughs> Normally, I just wash and go. Today, I was like, I'm going to put in a little effort for you guys. I'm going to try to look good a little bit for you guys because I love you. All right. Those of you who tuned into episode one, which was my introduction, letting some of you know who I am. You guys, thank you so much for tuning in. It's so sweet of you and it was wicked fun. And um, a couple of you were asking, like some of you who are listening, like I said, you already know me, you know the story, you know who I am, whatever. But a bunch of you, hopefully, fingers crossed, who are, are newbies to uh, me and to what I do and to all this stuff, my story and how I came to do uh, the work that I do and, and uh, write and blah, 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 all the forgiveness work and all that stuff. Uh, we're kind of like, okay, you kind of you kind of cliffhanged us last time because I was talking about forgiving the guy that murdered my mother. And I said, I'll tell you another time. <laughs> Because, you know, if I just told you the story, like, we would have to sit together for, like, a month. So I'm going to break it up into little pieces. So episode two, KK goes to California, right? So this is a little sneak peek into the forgiveness stuff and how I came to be a spiritual mentor. But that's a much longer story. But this is, we'll talk, talk about this, like, this is the introduction, okay? Like, the intro version of how that came to be. So if you remember on the podcast last week, or yeah, last week, I was talking about how, um, you know, they caught my mother's killer. I had had this whole plan that I was going to go talk to him at the prison once I turned 18, because I had convinced myself that if I finally knew what happened that night, the night that she was killed, that I would finally have peace. Like I really thought that, that I could find inner peace from external answers. Okay, mistake number one. 
but I was 17, 18, stupid, right? I was like, stupid. How much do we really know at that age? So I was like, I devised this whole plan. And then lo and behold, a couple of months after my 18th birthday, before I could get to the prison, I was in college, I had exams, and I was one day away, one day away, you guys, rats, <laughs> one day away from getting to, um, you know, put my plan into action. And I got foiled, foiled again, <laughs> I got foiled in. Uh, he, uh, he killed himself, unfortunately, in prison. Uh, unfortunate for many reasons, and that's what we're going to dive into a little bit today. So I'm going to kind of um, back you up just a smidge, rewind, okay? And so I found out on the phone, this is what I told you guys last time, right? I'm in my dorm at BU at Boston University, didn't have a phone in my room, I'm down in the lobby and I'm like speed dialing, like because my, my boyfriend at the time, who was actually a little bit younger than me, um, I could, when I was on the phone with him, just making a normal phone call, like, hey, one more day of finals, then I get to come home, blah, blah, blah. And I could tell he was, you know, acting a little weird. And he um, was being a little too nice to me, like suspiciously nice. And he was nice to me, right? He loved me and all that stuff. But I was like, eh, you know when somebody's just being like a little over the top and you're like, that's fucking suspicious. Like, what's that about? So I was like, uh, hey, Francis, that's what I called him. I was like, oh, what's going on? And he, that's when he said to me, so the guy that killed my mom, his name was Paul Caravo, and he said, Caravo is dead. And the piece that I didn't tell you last time is that he had actually died a few days before they actually told me. So I'm in Boston. I, I'm not getting the Lawrence Eagle Tribune anymore, right? There's no internet at that point. This is like 1986. There's no going online to find out that the, your mother's killer has like taken his own life, right? So back then, everything traveled word of mouth. You know what I'm saying? There weren't pages and beepers and all that stuff. So um, I found out from him and I was so bullshit, you guys. I was so mad that all, all, all the people back at home had this important information um, and didn't tell me. Now, in fairness, none of them knew my plan, right? I was a kid who spent a lot of time um, alone, like, and also I had a very rich inner life. Like, I spent a lot of time in my head. Double hands up. Anybody? Any Mandy? Can I get an amen? Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Spend a lot of time up in the old noggin, right? Talking to myself. I talk to myself all the time. Anybody else? Do, do, do. I know. Hands all across America are being raised right now, right? It's a little weird. I spent a lot of time in my head. So I didn't share this plan with anybody. It's not like I think that if they had known, of course, they would have told me maybe a little faster, a little quicker on the uptake but they didn't. So here's the deal. So I get this news and it just <laughs> devastates me. It like devastates me because now my plan is blown to smithereens and there's no way that I'm going to be able to get the answers that I thought I needed in order to um, find, find that peace right? I just knew. And at that point, it, I wasn't even like, I'm 17, right? 18. I, I don't even know yet that that's what I'm looking for. So this is an adult with, with some spiritual backing, some spiritual background, a little time to process this stuff and be able to report back. This is probably what I was looking for. But back then, I just wanted to feel better. Back then, I was like, I, I was just wicked curious. And I was suffering more from not knowing what happened, right? That whole what the hell happened? I was suffering more. Now, look, there were other people in my family who didn't go to the trial. We weren't allowed to go to the trial. Um, we weren't allowed to go to the trial in 82 because, um, first of all, they were going to be showing very graphic pictures of the crime scene, etc. Evidence, physical evidence. They probably thought it would be traumatizing to us. But somebody also once said that they thought it would sway the jury and it wouldn't be fair if her like, you know, 13 year old, or at that point, um, I must have been at that point, I was probably 13 or 14. My sister was 15, maybe um, 16. Um, it, it would have been unfair because, you know, we would have obviously been crying in, <laughs> you know, in the audience, as they say, and they didn't think it would it would have been fair to the jury that, to have to look at us. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm just telling you what my little mind remembers. Okay. So um, a lot of people in my family did not go to the trial, even though they could have, and we weren't allowed to go. So I didn't know. I never really got the facts. That's, it, trust me, I have stories out the yin. I have so many stories. So story for another day about 
how I got some really inside um, inside and graphic information that uh, at that point did not was not asking for. Okay, so it was killing me, right? It was making it worse for me, um, not knowing what had happened to her. And um, I, I was so stressed out, you guys. Like, I think back now, um, if, if somebody had been paying close enough attention, um, and if, if, like, nowadays they have counselors who are sent to the homes or scenes of violent crimes. And they're like either social workers or therapists that have a background in this. And they kind of help the family process and deal with this new reality. That right back then, there was shit, shit out of luck. None of that stuff was going on. So we basically had a bunch of people trying to navigate this trauma and this tragedy, and nobody was really doing that great of a job. So um, I, I had surmised that this is what I needed, is I needed more information. And I was so traumatized and so stressed out that if I, looking back now, I probably had like PTSD, right? Um, I still have residual effect. I'm working on that actually uh, now. Uh, I have been working on that for a really long time. But anybody else maybe can relate um, irritable bowel syndrome. A uh, bunch of us who have uh, chronic stress uh, or had very stressful childhoods often develop that. And so also, it's a gain, it's a it's a brain gut disorder too. They don't talk to each other really well. Story for another day. I'm going to do a whole episode on irritable bowel someday uh, later down the track. Be waiting to turn, but you can't wait to talk about poop, you guys, right? So we're gonna we're gonna dive into that, and um and I also um still get like. I jump at loud noises. If there's fast or quick movement, right, it, it jumps and bright lights. So there's all these like little tiny residual physical effects, fight and flight, uh, cortisol and adrenaline like pumping in my body. So back then, oh my God, I was a mess. Poor me, right? I was like really struggling as a younger person to try and like navigate all these new, um, these new experiences in this new reality. So, um, I wanted to know, devise the plan, he kills himself, shit out of luck. So now, here we are, everybody's caught up, here we are, okay? So now I'm about to go home. I take my final, final, my last final, I hop in my little Silva Toyota Celica, oh my God, you guys, this little car was my first car, I loved it, and here's a little interesting note, I have only driven Toyotas since. I know you Amer like the Ford, the Ford and the Chevy truck people, the Americans, right? Might get a little pissed at me, but I happily say I've only driven foreign cars. My Toyotas, I am now my fourth Toyota. Never had a problem with them. Love them. Story for another day. You guys writing down all the future stories? <laughs> all right, so I get my little my little silver Toyota Celica. I go home. So now it's Christmas Eve. Um, and Christmas Eve, now remember, we had like three sides of the family. We had my mother's side of the family, the Connors. We had my biological father's side of the family, the Kennys. And then we had my step side of the family, the Cabrals, okay? So we would like make the rounds at the holidays. My sister was living in, I think she was in New Hampshire at the time, yep. And so I came home for Christmas. Uh, but we were go we would go over to the Cabral's house, my dad's house, my stepdad's house for Christmas. So, all right. So it's um, about a week probably after Carvo has hung himself. Uh, my sister and I are coming into the house. Now, my dad lived in Methuen with his new wife. And so all the Cabral's would gather there. My stepbrother, my stepsisters, my sister, my nana, my grampy, my uncle Manny, my cousins, right? My father, his wife, like everybody's there. So you can imagine it's an Italian Portuguese family at Christmas. So there's like calamari on the table and marinara and uh, like lots of bread, there's pasta, antipasto, there's a crown royal, a lot of alcohol. <laughs> okay. It's a party. It's a Christmas party. So uh, we go to my dad's house, we walk in the door. And the way my dad's house was, is when you walked in the door, you couldn't see who was at the door if they just kind of stepped in. Because over where the dining room table was, was like around the corner. So they couldn't see that my sister and I had just stepped into the house. So we were in the little, call it the little uh, entryway, okay? We were taking off our, our gloves, our hat, whatever we had on, our jackets. I don't think I wore hats, but it was my jacket, whatever. And we step in, and I hear this at the, at the table. So 
I kind of step around the corner. Now I can see them, they can't see me, okay? So there's the table with the spread of the food. My Uncle Manny, my, let me tell you about my Uncle Manny, okay? My Uncle Manny, God bless him, was the kind of guy who, well, he used to go to the track all the time. And like my Uncle Manny, like all, all the men, so my dad, my Uncle Manny, my grandfather, they always had white handkerchiefs. Right. Think of like either Fruit of the Loom, like foldables. They always have one in there. My Uncle Manny was like always wiping his mustache and his face. He was always sweating. Right. So my Uncle Manny like has his like, uh, you know, handkerchief like normally like wipes his face. He's got a glass of Crown Royal and he's like a toast, a toast. We're going to make a toast, you know. And I'm telling you, you know how loud they are, the Irish and the Italians. Right. So you got two like blonde Irish kids. It's been kind of brought into this family through marriage and so they're all surrounding the table we're gonna do a toast right and he's like hey hey like shut up you know pay attention i'm talking my uncle manny has on his shoulder this tells you like pretty much everything you need to know about my uncle manny so i think in his late 30s or in his 40s my uncle manny got a tattoo of an eyeball on his shoulder now if you follow it all um the Malukis or the Maluk or the Il Maluk, right? It's the evil eye. And the Italians right, believe that somebody can curse you and give you the evil eye. And so my uncle like has this big eyeball like on his shoulder tattooed on. And when I first started at his house, because uh, my uncle had a pool in his backyard in Methuen, we went over to go swimming. So I saw him like no shirt on, right? With the tattoo. And I'm like, Uncle Manny, like what's with the tattoo? And he's like, oh, the eye, yeah. And so I can see the bastards when they try to stab me in the back. I can see them coming. <laughs> like that's classic Uncle Manny. Okay. So Uncle Manny's doing the toast, wants everybody to shut up. My sister and I are in the doorway and we're boop, boop, boop. We're like watching. Okay. And my Uncle Manny says, a toast. And then boom, all eyes are at him, right? And he says this, to Paul Carvo. May that cocksucker rot in hell. Salute. And all the glasses start clinking and it's like, yay, right? And the noise goes up and everybody's excited. Whew. Now me, I can't speak for my sister, but me, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, it's Christmas Eve. And I know this guy, this Paul Caravo guy. He had children, little kids, like little kids. And he had a wife. And all I could think was like, they're over there celebrating his death, his suicide. And all I can think of is Jesus Christ, like what kind of a Christmas are they having over there? And in that moment, you guys, was the key. That was the beginning. That was the little crack. Like Leonard Cohen has that famous quote in his song, right? That there's a crack in everything. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And in that moment, there was a crack in my heart that allowed me to stop seeing him, this guy that had brutally killed my mother, to stop seeing him just as some sort of a monster. And I was able to remember his humanity and to start to see him as a deeply flawed human being who was somebody's brother, somebody's kid, somebody's father, somebody's husband. And I was like, oh. Now, it's not like, trust me, I did not have instantaneous, like what we call in the Course of Miracles, a holy instant where all of a sudden all was forgiven and forgotten. But... What the Course in Miracles often tells us, and we're going to talk about that, boop, I'm holding up the book for those of you guys at home, boop, we'll talk about A Course in Miracles a little bit later, maybe on another episode, because this one's already going pretty long, <laughs> but um, what happened in that moment is I had a willingness, and A Course in Miracles says that all that Spirit, all that Holy Spirit needs is a tiny bit of your willingness, in the beginning, just a tiny bit of your willingness in order to change your mind, to shift your mind from a thought system of fear to a thought system of love. And that actually is the miracle. When the mind shifts, it relinquishes fear, which is a conditioned um, thought system that we've been taught here. Okay? 
and to shift to love. So I can't say I fully shifted to love, but I had a tiny bit of willingness to start to see him differently, to open my heart to some compassion. And the compassion was like huge. So what's fascinating is, so they do the salute, right? Everybody clinks glasses. And then we come around the corner and step into the room. My sister and I are just like looking at each other, like what the fuck is happening right now? So my little Nana, okay? My Nana was like, I loved my Nana. So my Nana was like tiny. My Nana was probably like five feet tall at that. White, silver, white, pure hair, like white, white, white hair, soft. And she had a little sweater on. I'll never forget. She had a little sweater on. She always tucked her, always tucked her, tucked her tissues up into the wrist of her, her, like she'd like do her nose and she'd shove the tissue just like the men had the handkerchiefs. My, my grandmother, my Nana always had the tissues. So she does it, dabs her face, puts the thing in and she sees me and I, I walk over to say hi to her and to give her a hug. Right. And she's tiny. So I have to kind of like bend down to wrap my arms around her. And as I go to approach her, she reaches her little hands up you guys, and she puts them on either side of my face. She cups my face with her little hands. And she says to me, isn't this the best Christmas present you could ever get? And again, mind blown, because in this moment, I'm starting to realize, remember that Sesame Street song? One of these things just doesn't belong here. One of these things just doesn't belong. So I start to realize like, holy shit, like I'm different. And I'm not saying I'm better than. I'm just saying I'm seriously having a different experience than everybody else at this table. And I get it, you guys. Like we were raised in an environment, man, like eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You hit me, I'm gonna fucking coming back at you. I'm gonna hit you back twice as hard. Like we were raised like, you don't back down. Like you show up, you are fearless. Like you are tough. And there are parts of your heart you really kind of weren't allowed to access, right? So forgiveness was not, part, especially which is crazy as Catholic kids, right? It's not like forgive. There is no turning the other cheek. There was no like, let's try to be like Jesus and like somebody hits you, give them the other one to hit the other side. This was like, you hit my cheek, I'm going to knock you out. I'm going to knock you on your ass, you know? So I understand. I can look back now and go, of course, that makes total sense that that was happening. But it's not what was in my heart. And um, that, that moment, swear to God, that, that, was, that was a miraculous moment where I, I did have the awareness at that time. Dude, my spiritual team, and we'll talk about them on another, on another podcast, another episode, but my spiritual team was on the job. And they were whispering in my ear and they were like, hey, kid, pay attention, like pay attention, because I was really aware that I felt differently about that. And I wasn't taking any fucking joy in the fact that this guy had just killed himself. And that made me stop and think like, well, what's that about? And so that was the beginning of the forgiveness cycle. And what happened after that, so fast forward, that was my freshman year. So I'm going to skip some things, okay? I'm going to skip some things. But all I know is I was still suffering. Even after that, still suffering. Okay, so I graduate from BU. I'm hanging around in Boston for like a year. I had the best gig ever. I was the concierge at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Cambridge, which was a blast. And one of my best girlfriends, Mani, uh, Mani Saida, another, another uh, Sicilian Italian kid, uh, she went to school at Emerson. I went to BU and she was a year behind me. And Emerson had a really great placement program. So she, we were living together. I was like crashing at her apartment story for another day. Cause like when I graduated from college, you guys, I had nowhere to go. I had no home. I had no parents. I, I, I was like dropped off day one, 17. And then the summers and the breaks, like I just had to figure out. And my sister, God bless her. My sister let me crash at her house more times than I can count. So my sister was like looking out for me, right? Uh, because she like kind of became, uh, I never asked for it, but natural instinct, she kind of became like the, like the new like mother hen. It wasn't like super warm, fuzzy. Like we laugh about this all the time. But uh, you did what you needed to do. And she wasn't going to let her sister sleep on the street, right? So I crashed at her house a lot. So anyways, Monty's like, hey, I'm going to LA because remember, Emerson has a great placement program. She got a gig like at um, interning at CBS, which was really cool. And I remember thinking at this time, like, how can I leave? 
Like my mother is buried here. Like my whole life is here in Lawrence, like, like Lawrence, Boston, Massachusetts. Like, how can I go? I felt like I would be abandoning my mother. And I said, well, I'm going to talk to my sister and I'm going to see how my sister Kim reacts. And if she doesn't like, if she's like, cool, yeah, like I support you go after your dream. Like it wasn't even my dream. I was just like, what's next for me? I can't just stay here. <laughs> like, and I was like, go to LA, go to California where it's sunny all the time. I'm out of here. Right. Summer was my favorite season. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Woo! Give me an amen. So I was like, all right. So I said to my sister one day, I'll never forget it. I was at, doesn't matter where I was at, but I remember exactly where I was when I asked her. And I said to her, hey, Mani has invited me. She's asked me to go to California with her. And I thought my sister was going to be upset. Like, I thought my sister would be mad. I thought my sister would say, you know, don't go. Like, I don't know why. I don't know why I was delusional, right? But I was like thinking this. And um, so I told her, I remember exactly what I was wearing when I told her. And I remember the look on her face. And I was expecting obviously a different reaction. And she just kind of looked at me and was like, yeah, I don't give a shit. Go, go ahead. <laughs> and I remember looking back like, like, I remember just kind of feeling like, oh, she doesn't care if I go. <laughs> but let me say this, you guys. I really believe that that was her assignment. Her assignment was to be a little mean because if she had said, if I had sensed that it was going to make her sad or whatever, I probably would have stayed. I often talk about this. If my mother had lived, if my mother had stayed alive, I, I don't know if I ever would have gotten out of Lawrence. I don't know if I ever would have left. You know what I'm saying? So there's been a series of events. And so my sister kind of having that, that little bit of a beat it kid <laughs> actually worked in my favor because it was the, it was the catalyst. It, was, it, it wasn't necessarily maybe what I wanted, but it's what I needed and it allowed me to go to California. And so that, me leaving you guys, was also the catalyst for me starting to do research for the memoir and the book because I was like, I can't leave you. I didn't know when I was coming back. I didn't have that much money. And that's a story for another day too. Let me tell you about how I got to California someday. Mock that down. Is somebody taking notes? Write that sucker down. Uh, Doc Strasburg. I'm going to tell you the story about Doc. Um, so anyway, so I was like, okay, so if I'm going to leave here, I get to start to do a little, little work. And for whatever reason, my spiritual team dropped it in my hat. Like you got to do some research. And again, this is a story for another day, but that was the beginning of me starting to, to write the book and research the book. So that's a really powerful, pivotal point. Okay. But we're going to bypass that for today. So I go out to California. I'm living out there. I pretty, pretty much have no money. I have no vehicle. So I take the bus probably for the first six years that I live in LA. Uh, Monty, you know, Monty had alive parents, responsible parents, good home, good money, like, you know, came from a really loving, beautiful family. Um, and Monty and I knew each other because I dated her cousin for three years. So I was part of the family. So we were more like sisters than friends, right? So we're living out there. So sometimes I caught a ride with her, but mostly I'm out there on foot or on the bus or catching rides with my friends or however it worked out. When I first got out there, I didn't know, I didn't know anybody else besides Monty and her cousin, Kevin, who I knew growing up, right? So we get out there and all I know is like, I'm still suffering. I'm still suffering. And then, and then, dun, dun, dun. You guys, my mother starts coming to me in dreams. Now, whole other story for another day. I was a sleepwalker as a kid and um, I always had like really vivid dreams. So after my mother died, there was still a lot of sleepwalking <laughs> happening, but there was these really vivid dreams. And that's how my mother started to communicate with me. And I so wish you guys that this was like live, like you, like I could see hands raising or hats or thumbs or something, because I know that for a lot of you, your loved ones, right? Your ancestors, your, your, your loved ones that have passed on. So many of you have said to me over the years, yes, my mom, my dad, my cousin, my sibling, my grandma, whoever comes to me in dreams. And so my mother, my mother started coming to me in dreams. And um, my mother said to me in particular in one dream, um, but she said it a few times in a different way, different ways, but I'm a little thick headed, little doink, doink, right? Little thick headed takes a few times to get through the old <laughs> noggin. But one time I remember her directly saying to me this, 
she said, I've forgiven him. Now it's your turn. I've forgiven him, sweetheart. Now it's your turn. And I was like, shit. I don't. If you can't see me, right, if you're not watching this video cast, if you're watching it as a podcast, I'm doing the hands up, like shoulder shrug, like, ah, uh, no idea. I had no idea how to figure. This wasn't somebody stepping on my toes. This wasn't somebody talking shit behind my back. This wasn't somebody stealing. Hold on, I've been talking so much. I got to take a sip of water. <laughs> it wasn't somebody who was super clumsy. This was a big ask. Like, this was a big Big, big forgiveness. This is what we would call in A Course in Miracles a slow burn. This is a slow burner, right? This was something that was going to take a little time. So I was like, shit, now my mother has given me an order. She's given me a directive. And really what she was doing is she was giving me a pathway to peace. But I didn't know how to do it. Okay, so that's a little backdrop. So books have always been like a lifesaver for me. My mother, um, I always say we didn't always have food in the house, but we always had books. And so when we were, even when we were little kids and my parents would be broke for whatever they spent their money on, like the scholastic school programs. You guys remember those? Anybody around my age, around 50, you remember that? So at school you could order the books. And I like was obsessed with like Clifford, the big red dog. And I would order all these books. So I love books since I was a kid. And, um, I always say, and people sometimes laugh about this, and I'll tell you this story. And you guys like to write this one down. Uh, I got a Stephen King story. So Stephen King basically like saved my life, like saved my ass. Uh, his books were, um, it was like somebody threw me a, a friggin', uh, you know those life preservers, a life raft, right? That was Stephen King. So books always, always, always helped me. So I love the library. God bless libraries. God bless libraries, man. Uh, they leveled the playing field like for lower income kids. Like they allowed us to access world's information and knowledge that otherwise may not have been available to us. So a library card, you guys, is one of the best gifts you can give your kids. Um, so spent a lot of time at libraries, always had books, loved books, read books all the time, loved reading them, loved stories like all the time. So I ended up when I went to California. So remember, this was before Borders books. Remember when Borders came onto the scene and uh, there were like chairs everywhere and a cafe and bathrooms, like you could hang out in the bookstore like all day. So in Burbank, California, where I lived, there down by the mall was um, a store called Crown Books. And I eventually went on to work at Crown Books, but when I first got there, I just spent a lot of time there. Uh, it wasn't too far from my house, so I could take the bus where I could walk. And um, so I spent a lot of time in Crown Books. So one day I'm in Crown Books, okay? And remember, I'm suffering, I know I need to forgive, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I was really still into weightlifting, working out. Um, I, I was fascinated by bodybuilders. I wasn't personally a bodybuilder, although I did like to throw around some heavy weight. And uh, the gym was actually right around the corner from the bookstore. So I would often go from the gym to get my smoothie and my bagel and then over to the bookstore. <laughs> and so I'm in the bookstore and I'm heading back towards the fitness and like weightlifting section. And as I'm walking down the aisles, I hear a voice in my head say, you should go to the self-help section because you could really use some help. <laughs> what the fuck is happening right now? So I literally, you guys, when I talk about, right, and we'll get into this later, but just a little snippet. When I talk about the voice for God, or when I talk about, you can call it gut instinct or intuition or universal signs, I often call it the voice for God, right? It, we don't always hear it as a voice. Like I said, sometimes it's an intuition. Sometimes you just know to go left instead of right. Sometimes you just know to pick up the phone. Sometimes you just know, I don't trust that person or yeah, I should take the gig or whatever it is. But this was clear as a bell, a voice in my head. And I was just like, okay, self-help it is. So I go walking over to the self-help section. Now remember, this is like 1992-ish. Okay, so that means the, the self-help world is blowing up in LA, right? We've got like 
Yanla Van Zant uh, in this around this period of time. Tony Robbins, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, um, the Agape Church, Michael Beckwith, like all these. It was all, Wayne Dyer. It was all happening in in California. So I was like right in the hub of it. So there's a pretty big self help section on the on the wall there, right? So. Imagine this for those of you who are just listening, not those of you who are watching, right? But those of you watching, because you can see me, you're going to see what I'm about to do. So I'm walking down the aisle, you guys, like do, 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 do. The books are on my right. The tall stacks of books are on my right. To my left are like the lowest stacks of books. And there's nobody else, you guys, nobody else in that aisle but me. And as I walk down, I shit you not, this book and the people, people who are watching can see it goes, boom, right off the shelf at the feet of me onto the floor. And I look down and this is the book that lands there. So what I'm holding up right now, you guys, is an old school, like old school version of A Return to Love from Marianne Williamson. So Marianne Williamson is now, right, this was her first book amazing, huge, best-selling book. She was on the Oprah show and her career like blew up, okay? So Marianne was like a local celebrity in LA. She had done a lot of great work um, with um, AIDS patients and uh, the AIDS crisis that was happening in LA. She was doing all kinds of stuff and she had started lecturing on what was called A Course in Miracles. More on that later. So this book is called A Return to Love, uh, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles by Marion Williamson. And for those of you who can't see, the old school version is basically a picture of Marianne's face. So this book lands at my feet and I look down and the first thing I have is a total mass hole thought and I go, who's this broad? <laughs> who's this broad smiling at me, smirking at me? So I pick up the book and I read it, okay? A Return to Love. Reflections on thoughts of principles, course of miracles, course of miracles. I was like, well, shit, I could use a miracle. <laughs> My mother's asking me to forgive the guy that killed her, and I have no clue. Like, I could use some help. I could use some more love. I could use a miracle. So in those days, there were no chairs in the bookstore. So I just basically sit my ass down on the floor, and I start to read this book. And you guys, this book blew my mind, Okay. I probably couldn't even afford it. I probably went negative in my bank account to buy the damn thing, right? But I sat down and it was, I said, I had never before heard anybody talk about love this way, talk about God this way, talk about forgiveness this way. It was the first time that anybody had ever given me a clue about the fact that my suffering was my own choice. Can you imagine that shit, hearing that for the first time, that my suffering was a choice that I was making and that I could make a different choice? Woo! Right in there lies the freedom, you guys. Right in there is the hot beat of fearless flow, which is what I teach, right? It was like, what are you talking about? What, I am at the effect of the world, Mary Ann. Don't you understand that I'm a victim? Don't you understand what happened to me with my big old victim story? And here was this little tiny lady telling me, um, no, sister, you got it wrong. You do have a choice. You could choose peace instead of this, A Course in Miracles says. You can choose peace instead of this. I can choose peace instead of this radical. How does one do that, right? So I buy the book and I study this book. I can tell you people all over the world, this book has helped hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, okay? This book, game changer, life changer. I give this pretty much to all of my clients. Anybody I know who's suffering in any way, I'm like, I got something for you, right? So, but remember, here's the thing. It's reflections on a principles of a course in miracles. And it's like, so what the hell is that? And now I'm holding up, this dense mofo of the book. This is like a 1200 page book called The Course in Miracles. And within this book, you guys, was the answer to my freedom, to my salvation, to how I was going to forgive. So that was the beginning of it. 
And the story goes on and on about how um, I came to study and live with and work very closely with Marianne. And that's a story for next time. <laughs> I will continue that story later. But I will just tell you this, you guys. Um, it was by the grace of God. You can call it the grace of love. You can call it pure, stupid, dumb luck. I don't care. I just know a miracle was at work in my life. But what started that sucker is that I had a willingness to see myself, to see her killer, to see the situation in the world differently. And it was that little crack, as Cohen says, that started to let the light in. And I think that as soon as I relinquished having to make it, now look, what he did was wrong. Yes. Did he deserve to go to jail? Yes. Should there have been justice? Yes. Should he have been held accountable? Yes. But I was taking no joy in his suicide because that, like, you know, the murder itself had an exponential effect. There is an exponential effect of violence that um, a lot of people don't quite understand. And when he killed himself, um, there was no satisfaction in that because it was just like for so many people ripping, ripping, you know, the Band-Aid off a wound that was still, still bleeding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and um, yeah, that was a really, really big thing. But I will just say through, through these two books, you guys, I have read a lot of books in my life that have changed my life. And I will share them with you uh, on our journey together here on the Karen Kennedy Show um, but these two right here, Return to Love and the Course in Miracles, Game Changes. Um, and so I'm just going to say to you guys, if you have something in, you, in your life that you need to forgive, and it might be yourself, it might be somebody else that you think did something to you, and we will talk about that a bunch on this show, right? Uh, seeing that, thinking that we're at the um, effect of the world and forgetting that we're actually the cause of what we're experiencing, that the world is an outward reflection of an inward condition. Uh, so peace, inner peace begins inside with you. It doesn't lie out there. At the time, oh, I didn't know that. But these are some of the things that I started to learn when I became a student of A Course in Miracles. And I've been a student of A Course in Miracles now for like over 26 years. And it's legit no joke. It is not, for, I always say, it's not for the faint-hearted. You know, Gandhi has a beautiful quote. Gandhi, who's on my spiritual team, Gandhi says, forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Weak, the weak cannot forgive. Mm. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. For it is only the strong that can actually forgive. The weak cannot forgive. And I took that like as a challenge too, because that's the kind of kid I was, right? Duke's up. Uh, I was like, oh, motherfucker, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to forgive. And I always say that this being human is like being in the fucking forgiveness Olympics. And I'm going for the gold. And so these books were like mind training. It was the beginning of my mind training to train my mind to know that there was a better way. There was a different way. And so I consider myself so blessed and so lucky, you guys, that um, I went into that bookstore when I did, that I heard the voice and trusted it enough to listen to it, took instruction, right? So there's a prayer and a course in miracles that I say every single day, every single day, more than once, but I always start my day with it before my feet even hit the floor. My daily spiritual practice always includes this prayer. Okay, it's, 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 it's from A Course in Miracles. It's modified. I just kind of switched one, one of the, uh, it's all the same words. I just moved it a little bit, but this is what it says. Please have me go where you would have me go. Have me do what you would have me do. Have me say what you would have me say and to whom. Please use me. I'm going to drop that again. Listen now. Have me go where you would have me go. Have me do what you would have me do. Have me say what you would have me say and to whom. Please use me. So these are the books that taught me, right, to be in service to the highest part of myself, to be in alignment. And you guys who know me, you know I'm doing that hand gesture, that arm gesture that I do. I'm in alignment with the divine. That this body of mine, my mouth, my hands, my feet, this vehicle, this conduit could be used for love. It can be used for peace. It can be used to help liberate myself and my brothers and sisters. 
to be in service of forgiveness. And this is what A Course in Miracles teaches you guys, the peace of God, the peace of God's love, the peace of all peace <laughs> through forgiveness. And so this is the journey that I've been on. And we'll talk a lot more about this on other episodes. And I'm so excited to have other guests. Um, our first guest, you guys, I'm so excited to bring him to you shortly. Um, a couple more episodes. Um, because he had a really big forgiveness journey too. And so I'm going to be talking to a lot of people who have had experiences, some that maybe you haven't personally been through and look at, let's be honest. I hope you haven't been through it. You know, Monty once said to me, Monty, who I've been talking about, she once said to me, um, I always felt bad for you and what you, what you went through. And, um, and she said, and I always hope that I never had to fully understand what that felt like. And I totally know what she means by that. So there will be people on the show who have stories and experiences that maybe those exact things didn't happen to you, but you can relate. You can relate to the challenge, the suffering, the grief, the obstacle, and then maybe how they overcame it. And we get to learn from each other. We get to, as Ram Dass says, the beautiful Ram Dass says, we are all just walking each other home. And that's what we're doing on this podcast, on the Karen Kenny Show, you guys. We are all just walking each other home. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in. I see you guys. I celebrate you. I appreciate you. And I love you. Wherever you go, may you be a blessing. And look, if you're somebody who wants to learn more about working with me, um, if you have some big slow burner, some slow burn forgiveness stuff yourself, and you've tried everything and you need help, this is the work that I do in the world, right? I have a six-month group coaching program. I have a six-month one-to-one program, and I'm now developing a year-long intensive one-to-one -one mentoring program with me. And it is a deep dive and it is a, a process of learning how to shift and move from your story to your glory, right? Being able to, 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 to not just like talk about it, feel it, like live it, to really live from a place of love instead of fear and to be able to train your mind to choose love instead of fear. You guys, if you can do that, you can live a miraculous life. You can start to live in the fearless flow. And that is my hope and my wish uh, for everybody. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so jazzed. I can't wait for the next episode. And thank you for hanging in here with me. I love you guys. Bye. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Karen Kenny Show. <laughs> I super duper appreciate your time, friendship, and support. And look, if something that I shared from my heart today somehow landed in yours, I'd love to hear about it. So please tag me on Facebook or Instagram or IG stories or wherever the cool kids are hanging out these days and let me know what your favorite pot was or what you found most helpful. You can find me over at Karen Kenny Live. That's Karen, K-E-N-N-E-Y-L-I-V-E. -E. And if you're digging what I'm saying and you want to hear more, I'd be wicked grateful if you could go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review because you guys, that's how you'll help me to keep spreading the love. And if you can think of someone that could benefit from hearing this episode, please share it with them. I'd also love to stay connected with you. So if the feeling is mutual, please go to karenkenny.com backslash freebie and download my free guide to building your spiritual team. Until next time, my brothers and sisters, keep living in the fearless flow. Know that I see you, I appreciate you, and I love you. And wherever you go, may you be a blessing. <laughs>